everybody and welcome to the Andy that's in the Bonnevilles podcast. Um, today I was fortunate to get to talk to uh, Rui Craney who's Lurgan, fellow Lurgan boy and he's a, he's a Sinn Féin organiser for Kildare and he is also a founding member of Trade Unions for United Ireland. Um, we're going to split this podcast up into two. Um, basically because I get to speak to Rory in the first, for the first hour but uh, Rory's girlfriend uh, Rachel Coyle who is a former uh, or, uh, advisor to Matt Carty uh, MEP and a current Sinn Féin organiser as well uh, advisor um, she was here she's Rory's partner so she was just coming along yeah, on Saturday afternoon why not uh, but we, she's uh, she was raised in America so we start to talk a little bit about uh, the Irish American experience with regards to Ireland, etc., etc. So that was an opportune moment to bring her in to, to hear her opinion. And um, so the first podcast is going to be with Rory, and the second podcast is going to be with Rory and Rachel. So two podcasts, they both come in in about an hour each. So it's probably a good idea to split those up anyway. We do get into the weeds a lot on this. Um, if you can, if you're going to stay with it, fair play to you. If you can't, or there's a lot of references that you that you're not just getting or whatever it is. Well, we'll we'll we'll, we'll try and help with that. But um, we do get into the weeds of this, so I hope you enjoy it. Like, share, subscribe, do all that good stuff, and uh, yeah, here we go. I'll do this in the Bonneville's podcast. Okay, hey everybody, this is Andy, uh, it's in the Bonnevilles, and we're here uh, in my studio with Rui Carini, who is uh, a Sinn Féin activist for Kildare, yep. is that right? Yeah. And um, uh, one of the founding members of Trade Unions uh, Ireland for, for United Ireland. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk about a couple of things, we'll go through them as we... Uh, as, as we uh, see fit. How are you? Not too bad, Andy. What are we doing? Great. Good, Great. good stuff. All good, all good. Yeah. Good. Really looking forward to this one. Good, good. I've been looking forward to it all week, mm. right? Good. Now, Rory wrote... Uh, you wrote an article for Unfoblock and... Yeah. The tri- the just Which was just published last week. Yes, it was, yeah. yeah it's and then the Tribune... Yeah, that was a few months ago. That was there, a few months ago. So we're going to talk about both of those. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll get to them. But uh, as I said to you before, I want to talk to about a couple of sort of more current yeah. issues rather than yeah, as your article was quite mm-hmm. it was more his, historical and yeah. all that. We're going to talk about a couple of things that's, that's happening at the minute. But um, one of the things uh, I don't know, I, I think we're going to be in agreement with this. But statue, all the statues coming down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. It's awesome, <laughs> isn't it? It is. I uh, just seeing like that that direct action that's kind of been missing and uh, and over the past few years. And you mentioned earlier, kind of about the culture wars and everything. Yeah, like nothing's done more to challenge racism, particularly in Britain, than like ripping down that statue of Ar- Ar- Edward Colston. Like if that didn't happen, um, the, the conversation about racism, the history of racism in Britain, the history of the racism within the British police just wouldn't have happened you know yeah. I mean there's all these people on the right kind of saying well this is kind of vandalising the country's history you know but like nobody <laughs> nobody talked about slavery yeah. when that statue was up and now all of a sudden more, everybody more, more people know about who Edward Coulson yeah. was and how vile he was he was an absolute monster yeah that's I, it I didn't, yeah. I did, I'd be honest with you I've been to Bristol I never knew I never heard the name Edward Coulson in my life Yeah, know yeah. all about him now that's it and like, see I think it's always um, also kind of reawakened kind of an interest in, in the slave trade and kind of just kind of how horrific it was like I mean like I think like certainly I'm not uh, Rachel's from America uh, was born in America she kind of was brought up of the um, throughout her education system um, just learning about the horrors of slavery and everything but it was kind of just glossed over here in Ireland I find uh, we didn't really learn about it that much but like yeah. past few years I've been reading more about it and then what, what happened in America and um, the George Floyd kind of reawakened my interest in the American Civil War and, and slavery and everything and it just like just the how utterly horrific that system was like I mean it's no exaggeration 
reason to say like that's that was as bad as the Holocaust. I mean, like you're talking about millions of people dying in the Atlantic, millions of people spent their lives. But that, that, being, that, you know? it, but, but that the thing for me, it's it's like that. I mean, we know all about it here in Ireland too. But it's whenever I hear people saying, you know, you should get over an imperial past, or if you've been, you know, and, and there are people that say that. I was reading some stuff during the week that made me puke. It was on. It was I think it was on Reddit. I was just some Irish people, and I was like, oh, no, Irish, you know, we've got some chip on our shoulder yeah. and we're carrying this stuff around. And I was like, fuck you, you know. Yeah. But for me, it's that whole, you know, I know it's just, this is sort of a silly, it's a bit of a silly pop mm. culture reference, but it, you know that movie, the Marvel movie, the Black Panther thing? Yeah, I haven't seen it. I've only seen the, the South Park episodes making fun of it. Yeah, but well, I haven't it, it, seen the real it's, movie. It's not, a, <laughs> it's not a great film by any means, but. The point that the tra- the point that the character is trying to make, not mm-hmm. the movie, I mean, the original point of the character, was what would Africa look like if there mm-hmm. wasn't uh, the victim of imperialism? Yeah, and it would be a modern, yeah, yeah. first world place. Probably we don't yeah. know, you know, but but it certainly wouldn't be what it. And people don't understand that the weight of imperialism crushes your culture for generations, mm-hmm. centuries, in mm-hmm. fact. Yeah. and uh, by losing all those people, like us in Ireland, you know. We know the thing about the famine. There was so many people here before the famine. There was so many people after the famine, and the, the population numbers have never recovered. Yeah. And with with, with that history of, of of imperialism, racism, uh, in America's case, in Britain's case, slavery. Mm-hmm. Hey, did you watch the Dave Chappelle thing yet? No, I haven't watched it on Netflix. Yeah. Oh my no, I haven't god. Seen it yet. Oh, you have to watch it. It's right. only 27 minutes long. Mm-hmm. It's free. It's on YouTube. It, they dumped it on YouTube free. 27 okay. minutes. I'm, I'm not going to ruin it for you, Annie, but you have to watch this. It's absolutely fantastic. You really must. But he explains why people are angry in a way that mm-hmm. he can relate to for people of his generation. And yeah. it's not that long ago. There is, there is his. his the, the last slave in America died in 1940. Do you know what I mean? That's how uh, recent he it ref- is. Like. He, ref- he talks yeah. about his grand. His father cried out when on his deathbed, cried out for his his father's grandmother. Mm-hmm. His grandmother was born a slave. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Was there? Uh, that's it. It was really recent as well. I was actually listening to kind of interviews of freed slaves that were recorded in the in the thirties. Again, showing you how recent it is. But like one guy whose whose entire family was owned by Thomas Jefferson. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like he's, this guy still held up as kind of an American patriot and something. All, to all the founders. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, like, all that's being brought in, uh, brought into question as well. But like, you see, when you're talking about uh, kind of imperialism in Africa and everything, now I don't like to kind of talk on behalf of kind of black people or no. anything because they're best kind of speaking for themselves. But I'm kind of reminded of a quote by like the communist writer Michael Parenti, and he says yeah. that like imperialism didn't go to Africa because it's poor; it went because it's rich. Exactly. You know, yeah. and he says the same. But South America, as yeah, well, South America, they? India, yeah. like the Brits went to India. India was the richest country in the world. They left 1947. It was the poorest country in the world. You know, it wasn't yeah. an accident. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't like just bad administration. What it was, was uh, I, read, I, read, I read a lovely tweet the other day. Somebody says, "So you don't like Luton? You're going to hate the British Museum." Then. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, just. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, the, uh, back to the, the statue thing, I just thought it was, it's amazing just to see the amount of people even just involved in kind of that direct action, openly breaking the law. Like, I think it's really, really significant. You can't underestimate how significant this whole Black Lives Matter thing is in America and Britain. Mm. I mean, like, uh, you're in the middle of a pandemic, and not only in America, you obviously have people rioting and burning stuff out, as they rightly should be, because they've they've a right to be that angry. But like in Britain as well, people breaking kind of the social distancing rules, engaging in civil disobedience about uh, about racism racism as well. So like this hasn't happened since maybe the toxic revs in, in the eighties, like you know. Yeah. So really significant, and I, I think another as I think it was Richard Seymour maybe kind of said it on Twitter the other day. One of the big significant things about Britain is like this is the biggest kind of engagement in civil disobedience in a long time in Britain and it's happened outside of the Labour Party and outside the trade union movement this is kind of really yeah. organic the Labour Party hasn't shown any kind of leadership on this yeah. uh, trade unions kind of haven't either um, so I think that's really significant as well yeah um, well I, I if, if, for, I think the lack of leadership thrown or shown across the West mm-hmm. in general and other places too obviously but I was, I mean, I would have me being in the West, I would, mm-hmm. you know. But the lack of leadership is yeah. astounding. What the, the the British government have 
up for us here in the north, obviously. The British government have fucked up literally everything. Mm -hmm. Every step of the way has been wrong. Yeah. They can't even agree on whether you should wear masks. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they couldn't even agree just to say, listen, just, just tell people to wear masks, just in case. Yeah. Just let's just do that. They can't even do something that simple. <laughs> and that's and that's across the board. America's a different story altogether. Donald Trump is getting he's he's starting to campaign for the presidency in, in November and he's getting people who attend the rallies to sign a dis, a, a, a disclaimer agreement that they can't sue him if he get COVID. Yeah, and the the other significant point about that is that he's holding it on the anniversary of the abolition of slavery as well, absolutely. you know, just absolutely like this absolute dog whistle to fascism, you know, it's frightening, it, like you know, it is shocking. Um, and then you see people like Bolsonaro in in Brazil, who's just aping uh, mm. Trump every step of the way. Trump yeah. does it. Bolsonaro tries to do it or does it the next yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, it's shocking. Scary time, you know. I mean, like Trump's going to win in November, no doubt. You know, I mean, like I mean, I could beat Joe Biden. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's all he has to do is get to, get him on a on, on a stage. Yeah, all he has to do is just whip up his base, which he's doing with what the police are at in America. That's just like whipping up his base in yeah. preparation for the election in in November. Um, and like, is he on the election as well? And Aaron Bastani kind of made a, the point on Novara Media uh, last week as well. Like all these kind of middle class liberals and Democrats telling these black people that are right rad and uh, well you need a you need a register to vote uh, and you need like but like first of all like there's a, what's that one out of every 13 black people ha have been disenfranchised because they're not allowed to vote if they have a, a conviction criminal record yep. yeah secondly they had a candidate uh, in Bernie Sanders twice first time he was he was shafted by the democratic leadership and the second time he chickened out of the fight so like I mean they, they've tried these people have tried the they actual also, arena they, they, so they, they also had a black a black as, as Jimmy Dore says a black man with a Muslim name yeah yeah and he yeah. just screwed them he was just the, the the representative of Wall Street yeah yeah that's it yeah and you know, just <clears throat> absolute disappointment uh, must be felt in, in kind of black communities as well just but, th but that's the whole thing I was it was I was listening to um, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of the way the discourse goes which, which will actually I'll maybe leave this because mm -hmm. it leads me into a question I want to ask you later on about one of your articles so I'll not mention that we'll move on um so I'm going. I got an accusation. Okay. Apparently, Sinn Fein are funding Antifa. I wish that was true. I'll be honest with you. So I read. That That's actually a good idea for an Irish <laughs> motion. <laughs> <laughs> I read that um, uh, Irish America's Sinn Fein sort of online store, mm -hmm. one euro from every sale goes towards funding Antifa, yeah. and the guy says someone needs to tell. Uh, the, the treasurer of Antifa because you'd be delighted <laughs> 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 you know so um, so how, how do you respond to that terrible accusation uh, like if there, if there was anything <laughs> Sinn Féin would be begging for money off Antifa after fighting about six elections in the last couple of years yeah so uh, <laughs> I know it's hilarious it's, isn't it uh, it's mad like There's, you know it's not even an organisation you know it's a, it's yeah, a flag when you've got it's that an like, idea. You know, that's, that's, it's an idea that's all it is but you can't if you, yeah. you know the, the, on, on, a, on, a, on a more serious point the fact that 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 simple distinction can't be communicated. Yeah, yeah. And that it is used, like, uh, the Democrats in America, for example, well, which is where this is all coming from, mm -hmm. the Democrats in America are still blaming Russia for these, mm -hmm. they're blaming Russia for these reds. The Republicans are blaming Antifa. Mm -hmm. And no one's pointing the finger at 60 years of decimation of the middle class. Yeah. Of complete undermining. Yeah. Or the Jim Crow laws or Jim slavery Crow, complete, or, com you know. Complete, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's it. No, it's Antifa and it's real. And, and that simple point. But then maybe it is being communicated because people aren't voting. Yeah, people aren't buying it. Like, you yeah. know, people aren't voting, people aren't buying it. Like, obviously, the last election, most Americans didn't, didn't vote. Yeah. Um, but yeah, pe people aren't buying it. I mean, uh, like, like the, the, what's happening in America is a mass movement. It's a fucking bordering on revolutionary, like you know. Yeah. Um. So they're not buying kind of what the, the media saying. They're not buying what, like their supposed leaders in the Democratic Party are saying. Um. So no, nah, like I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's it. So we'll move on. We'll talk about if you don't mind mm -hmm. the most recent article you wrote. Yeah. Right. Which was published last week. Yes, I, it should be out this week. It should this be this week. The paper editions out this week. Yeah, papers out on Fob Block available in all mm. good bookstores. Bookstores. Mm. <laughs> I read the article. I must say, well, I'm going to read it anyway. But great article. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. It yeah. was brilliant. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with the most simplest of questions. Yeah. What is an Irish Republican? 
Okay. Well, first of all, can you give the context of that article as well yeah. when I'm answering that question? The context of that article is obviously um, Sinn Féin is now, well, it have been the biggest party in Ireland since 2014, uh, but we're the biggest party in the South and uh, second biggest party in the North, but on the island, the biggest party in the country. I'd say we're probably verging on the biggest membership in the country as well. We've had thousands of people joining the party all across the South. And what's that after. demographic look like? Uh, it's mostly young people. People, uh, yeah, like mostly people under under forty. Are, are joining the party and I mean in, in their thousands you know I mean we've we've been inundated certainly in Kildare of about three or four hundred new members and uh, within about a month after the election so I was kind of <clears throat> I kind of wrote this article because um, I think we as the biggest party the biggest working class party in the country we're the voice of the kind of disenchanted working class in Ireland and we have a duty to kind of show them ideological kind of leadership and kind of put a bit more emphasis on political theory and I've written it in the article as well mm. I kind of think Irish Republicans have neglected that aspect of our work mm -hmm. of developing our ideology I mean the last great ideologue of, of Irish Republicanism was probably Jerry Adams um, you know anybody that kind of compares them is probably the likes of James Connolly you know so you're, you're talking a few kind of people that have really invested in this and it's been to our detriment I think and I think if we were to channel this this mass of people that we've got we need to kind of develop our ideology be clear about what we stand for so the things that I've kind of proposed what modern Irish republicanism is about um, the first one the first I've, I've broken it down into kind of five component parts yeah. kind of stealing off Lenin's idea of the three component parts of Marxism the five component parts of Irish republicanism so I think the first aspect is uh, national sovereignty, national liberation, which is obvious. Um, second is socialism. Third is feminism. Fourth is internationalism. And the last and uh, probably most important is, is anti-racism. So the national liberation, national sovereignty, well, that's kind of, you know, like, it's just obvious for us where Irish Republicans would believe Britain has no right to have any say about what happens in any uh, part of Ireland nor any other foreign power for that matter uh, yeah. but I think national sovereignty is, is a really important discussion today because it's an, it's a concept that's been kind of hijacked by the far right um, in the past few years like I mean the, ele the election of Donald Trump the election of Orban in Hungary um, the, I'd say Le Pen could probably win the next French presidential election yeah. based on the same thing yeah. taking control of your own affairs and um, and like that's not a right wing kind of issue. Like that, that's uh, that should be a left wing principle, and the left need to uh, reclaim that. And there's a there's a great book that you should read. It's called Reclaiming the State by Thomas Fazzi and William Mitchell. Okay. Uh, it's arguing as well. They're actually pro Brexit left left wingers, um, but. Yeah. They're arguing that we, we need to reclaim that because any pro progressive change in the interest of working people in history has been done through the nation state. Anything through the 20th century hasn't been done through the European Union, not through the United Nations. It's been through the nation state. You look at the National Health Service, like that happened through the nation state. The welfare state across Europe happened through individual nation states yeah. uh, doing that. So we need to reclaim that. We can't abandon that ground to the, to the far right. Uh, second aspect of it is, is socialism. And I think this is in particular that's something that Republicans really need to work on, like what it means to be a socialist as well in the 21st century, why socialism is important to, to Irish Republicanism. Yeah. And I mentioned it in the book as well, the, one of the last kind of theoretical books that on Irish Republicanism, write, written by a supporter of Irish Republicans, was um, by Owen O'Brien. It's yeah. Sinn Féin and the Politics of Left Republicanism. It's a fantastic book, but he's really critical of the Republican movement. And again, the same kind of stuff I'm saying about yeah. our failure to invest in, in ideological development and developing a, a good political theory. Uh, but he says one, one of the feelings of kind of left Republicans and socialist Republicans in the past has been that too often Republicans use socialism as a means to uh, promote the national struggle rather than having socialism as an aim in itself, you know. And he makes the, the example of the likes of uh, Liam Mellows um, and he kind of turns towards socialism towards, unfortunately, too late in his life and then he was he was executed by the free state. Uh, but it was people of that kind of broad left republicanism, they, they always used it, as I said, well, this is a way to mobilise the working classes because socialism is popular, so we use it for the national struggle rather yeah. than it being a, a, an aim in and of itself. Yeah. Um, the, the other part is kind of for the, the left in general right around, around the world, what does it mean to be a socialist in the 21st century? Because too often 
what it means to be a socialist. A lot of people think it's about taxing the rich and redistributing yeah. redistributing wealth, and like that's not socialism. That's Keynesianism. That's <coughs> kind of liberal yeah. capitalism. Yeah. Socialism is about economic democracy. It's about uh, workers having direct control of their workplace, being able to decide what happens in the workplace, who their managers are. It's about planning the economy rather than leaving it up to the free market, the free market and it's yeah. about public ownership of the means of production so we need to talk we need to talk about um, public own ownership of major industries again like yeah. for like we have the side of our lingus nearly going to bust like a, a couple of years ago that was a public publicly owned company yeah. privatised by Fine Gael and Labour yeah. and now it's going to go bust because it's not profitable to keep all these people uh, in employment I mean like as, as if there's no national benefit to having a national carrier it's an island need to we're be an island nation we need, we need you need, you need, you need, you need to, it's, 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 it's infrastructure it's like yeah. we don't need roads yeah that's it yeah that's it you know uh, so look uh, to tackle kind of the massive challenges of our time the, the likes of climate change the likes of uh, massive growing wealth inequality in the south in particular the housing crisis you need major state intervention you need publicly owned companies you you, you yeah. know you need some type of economic plan and yeah. uh, for that so like the left need to start unapologetically advocating kind of planned economics public yeah. ownership because for t- too often we're too apologetic about our politics the, the, uh, ad, exactly just sorry just not, I'll, I'll let you continue yeah. um, whenever I'm explaining uh, state intervention mm-hmm. to my friends who which amazes me how many people just don't understand the basic premise of what socialism you know this is what yeah. we're talking about right um, the way I put it is listen the free market can decide how many choices you have in pairs of jeans mm-hmm. in the shop yeah, or how many shoes you can get buy or how many different types of socks you, you, you have a choice of. Let that, that the free market decide that. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to infrastructure, health, uh, education, all these essential elements of our nation state, which mm-hmm. is what you're talking about, the basic building blocks of what is a nation state? What's the mm-hmm. point of having a nation state? Well, if it's not, if you're going to pull someone pre feudal off their farm and say, now, now we're a nation state, mm-hmm. he, he's going to go, well, what does that mean? Yeah. W- what do I get out of that? Mm-hmm. O- otherwise, I just go back to my farm and live and never leave the five kilometer area that I was born in yeah. and stay there forever. Do you know what I mean? It's down to basic fundamentals like that. Mm-hmm. And I have to explain, no. When you insert the profit motive mm-hmm. into your healthcare, yeah, then you're you're creating worse healthcare. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very mm-hmm. you know, you can you can have the choice in the shops. Do you buy Levi jeans or Wrangler jeans or whatever jeans? But when it comes to your healthcare, those choices shouldn't be there. Yeah, it's just it. be best healthcare. And if you take the wealth mm-hmm. of a modern Western nation, of which Ireland is, you know, we can talk about the taxation and that that that, that, uh, that they don't tax companies as yeah. they should but you take the wealth of those countries of a country like Ireland there's absolutely no doubt mm. that we can afford to provide the best health care that's available in the private sector yeah. to every man woman and child on no this reason. island and even Fianna Gael accept that now I mean like the first thing when the pandemic hit was they took a, a, end up temporarily into public ownership of there, private exactly, hospitals exactly, you know, so yeah. even they accept that you cannot deal with public health in a private way, this isn't a market thing. This isn't exactly. an individual. It's such get a sick, simple thing. You. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it's, it's such a simple yeah. thing. It's such a simple concept. To try and get your head around the idea that the free market is a cure-all for mm-hmm. everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah, you know that that Ayn Rand neoliberal uh, libertarian psychopath. Yeah, and and th- th- that that concept has permeated, and you can see it permeate in the media. People are in the media across the across the world. You could see them. You going. You you you've read that book. Mm-hmm. You've read that fucking book. Mm, yeah. You know. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? Like, <laughs> it's you know? insane. Sorry. And c- continue. Yeah. Continue. No, no. Uh, so yeah, look. I mean, the, <clears throat> the issue about socialism and that developing that ideology. Look, that that's going to require massive bit of work, a massive push for political education, and not only the the party itself, but within our support base. We should be bringing kind of lectures, public meetings, which we started doing after the election there, yeah. directly into working class communities, yeah. educating these people, getting them organised um, to directly confront... You've got, the, you've got your work... You, I mean, you've, you, 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 obviously you know this, but you've got... 
you've got a hundred years of, of of propaganda against anything socialist yeah, yeah, to, to yeah. fight against. That's it, yeah. And then obviously we've got the IRA on top of that as well yeah. that we've to Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Actually, j- just on that, you're yeah. saying the it's more to do with that. One of the things I've noticed <clears throat> about southern uh, the southern political discourse is the convenient scapegoat mm-hmm. that that the southern politicians they, 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 that they, that they burden Sinn Féin mm. with the weight of the IRA yeah. for what they did in the north yeah. or what happened in the north mm-hmm. but the IRA that in the south the good old IRA, as Donnie Morrison calls them, you know, the good old, ex- wrong, you exactly, know? and yeah. and that and that there seems to be a mental disconnect between yeah. that. There's no connect connective tissue between the two. Yeah, is that real? Is that yeah, yeah, uh, that, like uh, that. Uh, it's it's a really for, it's a mad mindset. I think, like, I mean. I mean, you see, right. you see Republican parties. I mean, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael call themselves Republican parties. Well, Fianna Fáil, but I don't think Fine Gael would. Oh, okay, know, if, uh, and 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 they, but they would. They would attack Sinn Féin for their support of the IRA. Yeah, yeah. And it's just absolute double standards. I mean, like, I know for a fact there's, there's members of Fianna Fáil that helped the, pro- the, the provisional start off. But, like, even beside that, look, yeah, every single political party in the South has its links in some form yeah. of armed group. Even even the Labour Party has link had links to the official IRA right in the eighties and nineties. You know, the Democratic Left yeah. moving into them. Yeah. So nobody's kind of immune to this history of yeah. violence in in uh, in. But it still uses you know? still uses a cudgel. It's u- yeah, yeah, it's used and it's it's not used effectively anymore though. Because Is that right? no, it's not. It's definitely not. It's not as effective anymore because people are sick of hearing about it. I think that enough. First of all, there's enough distance passed between now and the end of the conflict that people can look at it a little bit more soberly yes uh, and see that the IRA didn't happen in a vacuum you know what you know we didn't the IRA didn't start the conflict didn't start the sectarianism all of those things predated like the the IRA being founded the approvals being founded in 1970 so uh but look, see, uh, you you look at the general election there um, back in February, and they they, they threw every sort of slander yeah. at us, all sorts of muck at us, um, and it, it just didn't work. People didn't buy it yeah. again. It's like what's happening in America and Britain. People just don't trust the media, and rightly so. If they were going to bring up nonsense like this when you're in the middle of a housing crisis and you're talking about what happened in 1973 on the Falls Road, I mean, and you can't it, you can't like, not see the housing crisis. You can't no, not that's see it. the health crisis. Yeah. Oh. Cake is coming. Style. <laughs> Good times. You, there you go. Thank you, Andy. Gentlemen. Cheers. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, I'll take a wee bit of water, actually, Andy. Please. Thank you, darling. Yeah, yeah, uh, for those of you listening to the podcast rather than watching it, uh, Jenny just brought us Thank in you, some <laughs> apple tart Cheers. that she just made fresh out of the oven. Uh, um, but no, no, look, what we're saying about as well about that that kind of onslaught that we got in in the general election. There, like that would have happened to any kind of left wing party. So do you use anything at all? But yeah. what I think, like as a northerner, kind of but that but that comes from a paucity of 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 of, of uh, policy. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not about the IRA. It's about what yeah. we would do with housing. You know. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Appreciate it. Cheers. Could you take that? Sorry. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, look, they don't they don't hate Sinn Féin because of what the IRA did. They hate us because we're going to freeze rents and reduce them. Uh, yeah. We're going to take on landlords. We're going to take on the developers. We're going to introduce yeah. universal free healthcare. We're going to take on the private health profiteers. That's where they hate us. They yeah. just use the IRA as a stick. And I like see as a uh, Nordy kind of working in the south and somebody who lived in the south for a yeah. long time. Like I think it's it's the most despicable kind of. Like disgusting kind of tactics, like that the Indo use, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil used to drag up the victims, whether they're victims of the IRA, the British Army, or whatever, they drag up the victims yeah. of the North just to score a point against Sinn Fein. And any other time, like Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Labour Party, they have nothing to say about the six counties. They're saying nothing about transport in the six counties. They're saying nothing about healthcare. They're saying nothing about Should education in the six counties. Apparently, yeah. where, 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 what was it he said a few weeks ago about? 
Aye, it's about a foreign embassy or yeah, or that's a, aye, he's got a, an international branch in Belfast of Fine Gael, you know. So, uh, but it shows yeah. you where the mind is. I mean, because that was, I mean, that that was where his brain first went to. That was he never that's thought it, that yeah. answer right. That was a reflex. Yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean? That's Sorry, it. let's get back to your article, yeah, yes, Rory, because yeah. it's good. And I real, I, I know we will drift off, but we'll we'll try and come back, back because it's good. I, I do, as I said, I do, I did really really enjoy the article, and it's good to talk about it. So. Do you want me to go through the other parts then? Yes, uh, yes. so, so yeah. Uh, so, yeah, look, I suppose the next part was... Uh, is I'm going to eat my cake. Yeah, go on ahead, work away, <laughs> work away. Uh, no, the next part I'd say of Irish Republicanism today would be feminism. And I, and I kind of think this is our biggest challenge now. Like, Sinn Féin, like, without doubt, like, we take our commitment to, like, increasing women's representation in politics, seriously increasing women's rights. We were at the forefront of the repeal campaign. Yeah. Uh, we've two women leaders, you know, unlike any other political party in, in the country. I think that's significant. But we we still have work to do on that. And I think the vast majority of women in Sinn Féin would say it as well, that there is... But what does that look like in practical so terms? So what does it look like? It, it We still struggle with representation. We still struggle to get... Um, enough women candidates will come to election time. We have a big job work to around that. Like any organisation as well, and probably I'm guilty of it as well, because we're just products of our society with our roots and kind of patriarchy and everything. Yep. There are sexist attitudes within yep. the party, like any other political party, but we need to challenge that directly, you know. And you, you maybe you've seen that with kind of we triangulated on the abortion issue for so long, but look, we yep. did the right thing in the end. And yep. uh, kind of Mary Lou, I, I've no doubt she pulled up a significant chunk of the Irish electorate with her to get that referendum over the line. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, feminism is a, a big aspect of the work, what we need to think about as well. And even on a, on a class issue as well, on feminism, we need to start thinking about what it means to be a feminist away from, like, the Clintonite type, like, break the glass ceiling yeah. crap of getting women in, into boardrooms and yeah. getting more women blue shirts to stand yeah. for, you know, as TDs. Um, what we need to kind of tackle is we need to address the fact that there's a huge chunk of labour, i.e. housework, uh, child rearing, child minding, uh, that isn't accounted in any economic model and in, in any GDP GDP figures. Which, that's work and that's kind which, of done by women. Which, as a part of the industry output of any country, yeah, we need is it. We like need 50% it. Yep. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> of the and economy. It's, it's not it's not accounted for, <laughs> yeah. but we're, we're all relying on it now with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And again, that's something the left in general have kind of ignored uh, up to date now we are the, the left in general we're talking about the European left it's something we need to do a bit more work on we need to think a bit more about it we need to think about how these people are compensated for doing that necessary work in, in society I don't have the answers I'm just kind of putting it out there that there is a significant chunk of human labour mostly performed by women that goes on paid Completely. and as a socialist that can't continue. Yeah. You know, we need to recognise that, that that is necessary labour, you know. Well, it's that, it's, it's that basic, for, I mean, it, it's, it's that basic idea that by, I don't want to use the word emancipate because I, 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 I don't really understand, I'm not, in the right, I'm not the right person to talk about that, mm -hmm. but with that emancip, I suppose I'm going to use it anyway, but with that equalisation, let's say that, mm -hmm. with that equalisation, it frees up our whole society yeah. in a way that Capitalism recognised mm -hmm. whenever it, whenever emancipation started to, to happen for women, capital, cap, uh, capitalism didn't look at a woman and go, okay, we can pay her the same as a man. They looked at a man and said, we can pay him less, pay her less, mm -hmm. and then we get two for one. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And you know, it's fresh no wages and everything. Like a, most couples have, have both have to both have to work and yeah. get in return what one wage would have got them for uh, exactly twenty but, thirty but, years but, ago. You but, know, but, but that the, the the idea that capitalism understood that yeah. almost to the point that you know if you could almost argue capitalism allowed it to happen because they knew in the long on the long it sounds a bit conspiratorial mm -hmm. at the minute, but. On the long finger, they were going to get it back. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know what I mean? They allow it to happen. They, they allow the, the so-called emancipation, which which hasn't happened, mm -hmm. but they'll call it that. And those two wages go into one and never everything's secured going forward on debt, which yeah. just further enslaves the mm -hmm. family and, yeah, the, con yeah. and the, yeah. the working class. That's it. And the, there's another aspect of that as well, is the fact that most... Like most of the necessary labour that is paid, the likes of... Like the labour you really require, like... Uh, 
domiciliary care workers, nurses, retail workers, uh, factory workers, you know, a lot of those low paid sectors are all performed by women, 90% women. Like, I mean, mm. I think, I, I forget the statistic, but look, the vast majority of women in, or the vast majority of low paid workers in the South are women because they occupy those low paid sectors. But like, it's not because they're important. They're like absolutely vital to like the economy, to society. Uh, and they're just so undervalued. Like, so uh, hopefully after the whole coronavirus kind of um, crisis, we do look at that at that low paid sector as well. Yeah. Um, and we, we never accept again somebody having to go and work in Tesco's for eight quid an hour or somebody have yeah. to uh, go to a lonely old person and help them out of bed every uh, every day. Um, get, like they pay, they get paid minimum wage and they don't get paid mileage in, in a lot oh, of cases yeah, yeah, in those yeah, private yeah, sector yeah, companies. Yeah. Uh, so we, we need to we need to look at all that. So like that's like the class dimension of feminism as well. Like that's yeah. why like I'm a, I'm a socialist feminist. There is a distinction between socialist feminism and, and liberal feminism. You know, the liberal feminism wants to just like have a woman figurehead at the head of Apple or Amazon while crushing trade unions, you know, and yeah. undermine another worker's uh, rights. Who, you see, you see the one the woman. BBC um, um, uh, go mental because the 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 the, the CEOs of the 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 stock market, I, it's the, the stock market companies. Aye, let, are, let's get more <laughs> more yeah, women in the stock market to behave like, exactly as badly as men. Aye, that's and not that's like, equality. Yeah, that's it. You yeah. know. Uh, so yeah, we need to challenge that. We need to challenge that as well. That that brand of feminism. Um, because the originally, like the original feminists, the most militant feminists in history, were all of that opinion. They all saw the struggle against kind of patriarchy and, and women's oppression as the struggle against capitalism. The struggle, like you yeah. know, they saw them as one and the same. Yeah. Um, and we kind of need it. Like we need to. Like, I, I wouldn't say we get back there because most feminists are of that opinion. It's just the people, the feminists who do get a platform tend to be the liberal feminists that don't look at capitalism, don't look at class. But the vast majority of feminists that I know certainly are of my opinion as well of that, like we have to look at the class as well, you mm -hmm. know. Of course. Together. It's um, all a class war. Yeah. I see it all. I mean, my, and again, my, I don't like to speak no, <laughs> for women or anything. Oh, no, ex but, no, exactly. But I, I think it's to challenge us as a man, as men and certainly what I was putting out in that article as well is something that I can do as a Sinn Féin activist and other men activists can do is just one simple thing is encouraging women's participation in, in politics you know yeah. and like too often that's kind of glossed over we need to look at why women aren't getting involved in politics why they're not getting involved in their local Sinn Féin coming even if they're members so we need to engage with those women yeah, directly yeah, yeah. see what obstacles but that's there a are. grassroots thing that's a grassroots thing and that's what yeah. I can do as a male Sinn Féin activist and yeah, right, yeah. like that, that's yeah. a big body work that, that the party yeah. kind of needs to do and, it, and is doing but like we need to take that really seriously because like we, um, we can't be well, you're not operating at full strength otherwise. No, it's a, no. It's a simple fact. No, that's it, you know. So, you know, uh, like, if that requires us kind of moving with our meetings, if it requires us holding more meetings on Zoom to accommodate single parents, you know, uh, we, we need to do that. We can't be yeah. just the old ways of having a meeting on a Thursday night that might not suit kind of parents yeah. who have three kids to look after, you know. Yeah. Um, we need to be flexible flexible about these things. Uh, yeah. uh, so, like, look, yeah, we, we've a big, big bit of work to do, and I just kind of concentrate on what, men Republicans can do um, to challenge that. Uh, and then, so the next one was internationalism? Internationalism. So, so explain yeah, that. Uh, so obviously in the, in the six counties, obviously we are kind of classified as a nationalist party and fair enough, like technically we, we are a nationalist party. We have no problem kind of uh, embracing Irish nationalism as long as it's progressive. But like Sinn Féin always has been an internationalist party. Our struggle has always been internationalist uh, it hasn't had an internationalist dimension it's been internationalist at its very core it's but like you look at it, every upsurge of Irish republicanism history uh, first one 1798 well, you have to reach out I guess is that the initial it, yeah, reflex you, or? you have to reach out but we're inspired we're inspired by world events you know yeah, yeah, and yeah. we are part of a, an international movement 1798 we were inspired by the American French Revolution yes. um, the Fenians 
in, uh, inspired by the revolutions happening around Europe at the time. James Stevens, the uh, the founder of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, he was a member of the International Working Men's Association, with yeah. along with Karl Marx and yeah. Frederick Engels. They saw the international struggle um, as part of uh, Ireland's struggle. You look at 1916, happened in the context of uh, growing up uh, revolutionary fervour across Europe. Um, the, the First World War, you look at our, the, the war against the Black and Tans, happened in the context of the Russian Revolution, the German Revolution happening across Europe. So are they coming to the latest um, struggle in 1969 to 1997? It happened in the context of the black uh, civil rights movement in America. It happened in yeah, the context of yeah. uh, the struggle against imperialism in yeah. Vietnam, against imperialism in, in Palestine, against apartheid in South Africa. Yeah. And I think like one of the proudest kind of things for me being a, an Irish Republican and a Sinn Féin activist is like our direct links with those groups, the likes of the ANC, like with the fraternal kind of bond that we've got with the ANC. Like, I mean, like, I don't, I don't like to, to gloat, but I think this is a, something worth gloating about for our movement. Go say, for it. See, like, when others in, on the Irish left and others kind of in Ireland, they were kind of against apartheid in principle. Yeah. Like, the IRA sent volunteers over to South Africa to train MK guerrillas. MK was the, the armed wing of the ANC. And they engaged in armed combat against the uh, the apartheid forces. Like these are boys from probably like Armagh and Derry and all like over yeah. in South Africa fighting for with Nelson Mandela, you know, to liberate but, South Africa. Like no other group in Ireland has the the actual concrete solidarity that Sinn Féin and the Republican movement have. And yeah. that's at the absolute core of our movement, you know, yeah. like that international aspect, you know, that's why we stand by Palestine, you know, it doesn't course, matter what, yeah. what happens there, what the ins and outs of the issue and is. And oppressed people is an oppressed people. Yeah. And you, you're going to, as I say, you know, you're going to reach out to find brotherhood yep. wherever, wherever yeah. you can find it. That's really. it. And see, I would I'd kind of put this challenge to kind of other leftists as well, um, people who wouldn't maybe call themselves Republicans or Republican socialists. Like, like, see internationally, like, like the Irish Republican movement is viewed as Ireland's revolutionary movement. Like, if you go to Cuba and you speak to somebody in the Cuban Communist Party, they know who Sinn Féin is. Mm -hmm. They don't know who People Before Profit are, or the Socialist Party, or anybody like that. Like, they view, like, internationally, we are seen as the, that revolutionary movement. You go to South Africa, the ANC and the Communist Party of South Africa, they are fraternal brothers and sisters is Sinn Féin um, you, you go to Palestine the PLO recognise Sinn Féin as their mm -hmm. brothers and sisters in Ireland um, no other group in Ireland is like that with the, maybe, maybe with the exception of the Communist Party in fairness to them, they, they, I know they did help with the liaison between the the IRA and the ANC guerrillas in South Africa and helped to set up the meetings and get them over there so uh, credit worth you there I think they, they put their money where their mouth is they were instrumental in getting the international brigades and everything yeah. uh, up and running in, in Spain in the 1930s but as I say apart from that like we're the people that kind of did international sol solidarity in, in a real way and like I think that's just something really proud of and see like what I really despise is liberals kind of in the north kind of just dismissing us as just nationalists and petty and parochial because yeah. you, do you know what I mean like we're just, like like, like where the hell are the Alliance Party when when uh, uh, apartheid South Africa was happening? Do you know? Do you know what I mean? We're probably doing. Sorry, pr pr probably, probably doing standing in the middle somewhere. You know, probably doing the same thing that liberals do all over the world. Uh, yeah, yeah. You we? know, wagging their finger and you know, <laughs> you telling people off for yeah. you know, giving a damn. Yeah, that's it. You know. You know. So look, that's that's uh, yeah. That's so so where does where does where does internationalism, modern Ireland, thirty two county socialist yeah. republic? Let's. Yeah. Uh, let's play the dream game. Yep. Um where does modern Ireland lie within the EU? Where does modern Ireland lie within the EU? Uh in what context currently or what I've envisaged? No, as, envisage. What do you, okay. what, what, what what's what's the what's the ideal? What's the ideal? Uh, the ideal is probably some I'm trying to word this carefully cuz I'm not yeah. speaking for the I for understand. Yes, here. I understand. Uh, like I dislike the European Union. I mean, I think it is a violation of national sovereignty. I dislike the fact that months before a budget is submitted to Leinster House, uh, the European Commission looks over it. I dislike the fact that the European Commission, from 2011 to 2018, uh, a, a friend of ours, Emma, Emma Clancy, did a report um, that found that the European Commission instructed member, sh member states 68 times in seven years to privatise or outsource their yeah, health services, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, like, th like th the EU is not this... There are, that's, the, all yeah. those things are very offensive. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. I, I, would li I like the idea of 
like a broad left in Europe kind of challenging the European establishment from within. If it can be done is another question. Like, I mean, Syriza tried to do it. They were on their own. Yeah. But I, I know... But since then, we've had a rise of communists in Portugal and Spain. And we've had Podemos in government in Spain. Yeah, yeah. we have could have potentially have Sinn Féin in government in the south. So... Mm. Things, is, things is, could is, change. Is, uh, is the EU changing within itself? Oh. It's okay. Uh, to, is the EU changing within itself? No. Ab- a possibility? I, I, that's what I fear. And I, again, I don't like the European Union. I don't like it's the how neoliberalism is kind of enshrined in its treaties and everything. Uh-huh. But what I fear is that the European Union or the Eurozone could collapse, but it's going to collapse and fall to the far right. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. that's that's what I fear. Uh and again, I come back to kind of Thomas uh, Fazzi and w- William Mitchell's point as well, and they kind of warned about this: is like when the left kind of see ground on national sovereignty, um, you're upon that ground to the far right. So when when like if the European Union collapses, I just fear that the far right will have coherent, incorrect answers to it yeah. that could mobilise people that the left won't have. Um, but look, yeah, I would like to see a reform EU. I want to see. I would like to see the treaties like Maastricht, Nice. Uh, Lisbon, Lisbon repealed yeah, yeah. Um, the the last treaty put back in 2012 was the physical compact treaty that was passed in the south that needs to repeal, be repealed like they, they all enshrine neoliberalism kind of in the law and there's no way to change that unless you get 27 member states agreeing to that yeah so I I, I really I really don't know what how I envisage Ireland kind of yeah in the European Union now all so I want to do is, is want to c- 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 could I, could Ireland exist uh, as itself, as a, as a socialist country within the EU, as it stands, uh, the, the reason I'm, the reason I'm asking because I genuinely don't know. Yeah. It's it's. Uh, I'm glad you're here so I can ask this question because Portugal has made a definite swing to the left yeah. within the EU. Yeah. So w- what's the? Do you know the mechanics about that? Maybe I'm not. Well, look the the, the if there's any left wing government in Europe uh, that actually tries to implement this program. The European Union is going to come uh, down on like a ton of bricks. It's simple yeah, okay. as that, and it has it has sorry, happened in Portugal, you're, you're, and Spain. They've, they've made they've, they've, it's it's fiscal policies that the EU yeah. is going to come down, but social policies the countries are free to operate so, those. Yeah, yeah, but, but the budget's going when to be when it comes to economics. Yeah, okay, like you're okay. you're constrained within that uh, that kind of neoliberal straitjacket. Like the two kind of most. No, three kind of most dangerous rules is around uh, public debt. You're not allowed to yeah. increase, or you're not allowed to have any more state debt than sixty percent of your GDP, and you're not allowed a deficit of higher than three percent. So, that yeah. kind of criminalizes uh, or it makes illegal Keynesianism, let alone socialism. So it's yeah. it's illegal in the European Union. Yeah, and like like they they have the European Union's kind of so they've defended themselves in their laws. They they have entrenched it in every every single treaty. Like and what what what's mad as well is that during the coronavirus thing, the EU has suspended all of these rules because like they're yeah. totally arbitrary. They're totally yeah. like these numbers are arbitrary. They have no, they make no sense economically. I mean like it, like this all made the eurozone crisis worse through the twenty tens, but they've suspended it for the time being. But as soon as the pandemic's over, like the, these these fiscal rules kick in again. So you've got like m- most countries in Europe. At the minute, because of having to lock down the country, so they're sitting at about 100 to 120 percent of their yeah, GDP yeah, in debt. Yeah, yeah. Greece is at about 200. So, like, yeah. are the European Union going to straight away just make their make their rules compulsory again? So that's that's a question. But the the question as well for for Europe is like like what's it for? You know, I mean, and, and mm. like like I'm sure a lot of countries in Europe are asking, places like Italy and Spain are asking, like, what is the European Union for? Like when they they showed. Absolute no solidarity with Italy when eight hundred people were no ran leadership. Was, you know. No, yeah, then there was just no leadership at all, and like the, all they did in in at the start of the the coronavirus crisis was to actually bring Italy to court because yeah. they were given state aid to their hotel company. State and, aid and who, illegal, sta- and who all, stepped you know? up to help? Cuba. Cuba and China. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know yeah, so yeah. it's it's that. I mean, it's like whenever you, whenever you read in the press or you you, you do the rounds, you you see the the. The fever dreams that people get into about the rise of China, 
Aye. He says it's not that they're. It's not. It's not so much that China's. It's you've abandoned. Mm-hmm. You know, you've abandoned what you would c- consider to be your your any solidarity with any country in the world yeah. that you would consider Western and capitalist. Yeah. You've abandoned them. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And what more more Cuban doctors went to Italy than German or Czech or British or Arab? Absolutely you know? unbelievable. Yeah. So and and like Cuba had coronavirus as well. It's not as if Cuba were isolated from it. You know. So you, you know, you know, I I just I thought this was fantastic. The um. Somebody else pointed this out. Um, if you were going to pick a symbol of modern Western capitalism, which is just basically waste, mm. waste and and excess, it's the it's a cruise ship, yeah, blubbing around the the Caribbean, <laughs> and it was who took the cruise ship in Cuba, Cuba, yeah, yeah that had, had had the cruise, the British, the well British register. Have you ever been? On a cruise? Didn't know to Cuba. No. On a cruise? Hell no. no I've never been. Cuba. Nah, no, never, yeah, never. I've I've never. Never. It's part of my. Um, it's on my wish list. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing. I, I really wanted to go before Fidel died, but um, mm-hmm. sadly didn't get there. Sorry. No, wait. We'll move on because. Yeah. Well, you sort of spoke about uh, anti-racism, but yeah. you want to expand on that? Yeah, anti-racism, anti-sectarianism. I said two two heads of the same coin. Uh, again, an absolute foundational element of. Irish republicanism from its core. Obviously, when Wolf Tone uh, kind of developed the idea, and the United Irishmen developed the idea of Irish republicanism, it was about mm-hmm. uniting Catholic, Protestant, mm-hmm. and and dissenter. Um, but in a modern way, like th- this is the most single. Re- like I, said, I mentioned earlier about our internationalism, our commitment to anti-racism is the single most. Uh, the single best thing that Sinn Féin has ever achieved, I think, is the fact that there's no organised far right in Ireland and I do put that largely down to to Sinn Féin Gemma O'Dahardy on a beach in Dundalk isn't do you know what I mean that, that, <laughs> she, she doesn't like, count no, uh, no. <laughs> 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 I, hold on mate. There's, there might be as many as fucking 10 or 15 of them people yeah. Aye, but you know? they got, <laughs> that's less, across the whole island yeah and they got less than 1% in the uh, <laughs> in the general elections there but like what, what Sinn Féin has done is a, is a number of things first of all we have channeled like angry working class nationalism in a progressive direction mm-hmm. uh, in the south mm-hmm. we have stolen the ground from the far right like mm-hmm. that's the traditionally the ground of the far right and we have stolen it um, they have no chance of competing with us because we have our history of uh, resistance to British rule and defending uh, the Irish uh, the, the concept of the Irish nation um, they just can't compete with that secondly see on like any other social democratic party in Europe every single other social democratic party in Europe have capitulated to the far right and call for immigration controls and all this kind of nonsense Sinn Féin not once has any of our people ever 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 kind of like countenance that kind of politics we have always been unapologetically well, on the side of immigrants it's that capitulation it's that, yeah. and it's incremental as well you notice yeah. it across, across it doesn't work That's, it, doesn't, it doesn't fucking work like, well, there's, you know, well, George Galloway he says um uh, he, when he was when he was talking about uh, when Jeremy Corbyn was responding to the anti-Semitism bullshit, yeah, and he says we have a saying in Glasgow: if you don't run, they can't chase you. Yeah, yeah. And it's as simple as that. And that's what uh, you know. Corbyn was capitulating and sort of and, and yeah. bowing ahead to the, this bullshit. All he got his teeth kicked in. Yeah, well, that's he, it. it. And as you say, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. You you stand by the merit of your own politics. So yeah. like, and that's on. I mean. It could have been easy for Sinn Féin and times just to capitulate to that grind, but like people like Jerry Adams, Martin McGuinness, they would never have let that happen. Uh, our movement would never have let that happen. It's just we are instinctively just anti-racist, yeah. and I think that's I think that's an amazing achievement that we have achieved. That every other country in Europe has a mass fascist party in their parliament. Ireland doesn't have any, yeah. you know. And I do credit like so kind do, of leadership do, 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 do you gen- do you genuinely think that this current wave of racism that is it's to and fro and across the world, really. Yeah. And it's pushing back and then they're getting pushed back and all that. Do you think that's not going to take root in Ireland? It can. It can. It can. Now, that's our response. That's how big Sinn Féin's responsibility is. So, we're obviously the biggest party in the South. We could go into government uh, this yeah. time round. If not, we could be the biggest party next time round and yeah. lead a government. If we let people down, if we don't uh, enact rent controls, if we don't build 100,000 yeah. houses that we yeah. promised, if we don't build, yeah. bring in universal health care, like, we are going to alienate kind of that disenchanted working class All base. the hard work's gone. Yeah, that's it. For so a generation. That's our big responsibility. Like, we need yeah. to make sure we do not... Do and does Sinn Féin, obviously, you, well, we know it, that. it understands that. We understand that. We yeah. aren't going to let people down. I really, like, I'm really kind of um, have confidence in the likes of Mary Lou if she was Taoiseach, like, 
she would not allow she, us to, yeah. to to capitulate the way the Labour Party did or anything, yeah. you know. So I have no fear of that. But th- again, we, we do recognise that that is our responsibility, that we have to give people hope. Um, we have to make sure we follow through with what we've promised. Um, uh, and yeah, as I said, just make sure we don't give the far right kind of any excuse to start organising in Ireland. But again, just come back to like, we just... And again, I, I'd give the, the the advice to other leftists throughout Europe. You do not capitulate to the far right. You cannot win yeah. by by <clears throat> trying to copy them on on yeah. immigration. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Like they're going to win that argument every time because that's their politics. It's yeah. like somebody trying to out republicanize Sinn Féin. It's like Fianna Fáil trying to out United Ireland us. We're the United Ireland Party. They're never going to win at that argument. Yeah. Like we're the left is never going to win the argument on immigration by yeah. capitulating the right wing ideas and it's a shame that <clears throat> the Labour Party did that, it's, you know. It, it, it genuinely, it's, it's like one of the things that really breaks my heart is did you did you see that um, the poem that Emile de May did? Can't be racist Didn't. and Irish. Right. Yes, yeah, almost. I, I'll I, say. I, I, oh, you have to check. It's absolutely beautiful. It's just a short two yeah. two verses, and she reads it to 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 her phone. I don't know what it was for, but it was perfect. And she and she references you know history and mm. she mentions history. And it's that whole. Idea. Whenever I see someone, Irish America, makes me want to cry mm. when I see the racism and bread and and I, you see all these Irish names at the top of gov the very top of government. You go, your ancestors would be ashamed of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. you know how dare you? And mm-hmm. she, but Amel de May put that poem out just uh, last week, and you can't. And it was very, it was very simple. You can't be racist and Irish. Yeah, well, that and and yeah, it's a, it's a good point. You can't like you, you're just abandoning your own history, your own people when you are racist and Irish. But like the South is a racist state systemically. I mean, you look at direct provision. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, brought in by Fianna Gael, yeah. or brought in by Fianna Fáil and the, the Progressive Democrats and supported by Fianna Gael. Um, you look at the citizenship referendum in 2004 that uh, Michael McDowell brought in. Uh, again, Fianna Fáil, Progressive Democrats. And it it, it pretty much stripped um, kids of their Irish citizenship if their parents were immigrants. So you had a yeah. situation, like it basically turned Ireland into an ethnocracy where if you're a white American and your great granny is from Ireland, you could claim Irish citizenship. But if you're yeah, a yeah, black kid yeah. born in the Matter Hospital in Dublin, yeah. you you don't have Irish citizenship. And yeah. that's that's the law to this day. That's supported by Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil. And like, so like, for the likes of Leo Varadkar... Disgu- it's fucking disgusting. Yeah, yeah, the, it's absolute, yeah it's the, absolute... the likes of Leo Varadkar to start trying and take the moral high ground against Donald Trump. Like, I mean, like we, we, were, we were locking kids in cages long before Donald Trump was through direct provision, you know, and that's yeah. Fianna Gael policy. And for Fianna, Michal Martin to be snacking about there about as if he's any better than Donald Trump. Like, yeah. he introduced a referendum that stripped black kids of their citizenship because of the colour of their skin. Do you know what I mean? Like, so Ireland is is racist, has That's been structurally r- racist. Uh, and again, so see, sad. leading again, leading that kind of apart, like leading that in the doll chamber, leading that um, fight against those racist policies was Sinn Féin. Like Sinn Féin stood against the citizenship referendum, you know. And, and, I, again, and how, how, a challenge how, how, to the liberals in the north who kind of dismiss us as narrow-minded parochial nationalists. Yeah. Like we're, we were standing against these racist policies when they wouldn't even stand in the south in the elections, so, you know. So how, how, how does this, uh, with Sinn Féin's ground game, how does it resonate on the ground, the anti-racism uh, message? It, it's it's challenging at times. Yeah. Like there is racism in the south. It's getting more prevalent, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, like I think it's, it's getting more it, prevalent everywhere. It is. It you is, know. and it's sad to see it in, in Ireland. Because, uh, but yeah, we we again we don't apologise for it. None of our political reps capitulate to it. We no, stand up against it. Delighted. So it's difficult. Yeah. But but what I would say to that is we can still channel cha- uh, channel their anger in a progressive direction. So I I'm sure that. People who kind of at the tours, maybe the, the small number of people that maybe brought up immigration as an issue, um, maybe because they're angry and they don't know who to take it out on, they probably voted for Sinn Féin anyway. And the reason why is because we give them hope. Because yeah. we told them like that there is something better. You don't have to tolerate this. You can have a fair rent. You can have a, 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 a home that's affordable. You can have free health care. Uh, people with no money and no power, isn't that your yeah, problem? That's it. You so know. the solution is to give people hope 
yeah. that the left need to be unapologetic about their politics. We need to give people hope and something to vote for. Yeah. Because if you capitulate the way Corbyn did, if you yeah, yeah. if you could capitulate to the far right the way uh, Ed Miliband did, you know, with his mugs, the right uh, tough on immigration, all this nonsense, like you just disempower people and you, you it's, disillusion it's them. It's just a distraction. We don't want to do that. It's yeah. not the fucking issue. Yeah, yeah. It's not the problem. You know, the the fact that you've you know you you you, you you're you can't afford you're worried about you're, you're trapped in a fucking job you hate because your mortgage is fucking gutting you yeah how's how's that some brown fella coming across the mediterranean's fault that the british bombed out of his house yeah how's that how's that his fault yeah that's it. It, it genuinely I've, I've got a song i'm not i've got a song on a new album i'm actually going to drop a video for it mate it's not even my album will not even be out for another six months but it's called an analog a treaty on violence and mm -hmm. it's talking and it's just me talking about you need to stop blaming fucking brown people it's capitalists this yeah. is the fucking problem i ain't gonna do a little video because it's just timely at the minute it's yeah. just what it is i'm gonna drop it the the frig. yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, 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 I'm meant to do it yesterday and I'm gonna bring it <laughs> it, but i'll do it yeah. during the week but anyway so bring it what right uh, that article was great again i would encourage anybody uh, to read it, although you you have you have gone through it really really well there, but so we'll move on if you don't mind to the article in the Tribune, the Tribune and Jacobin, yeah, which was published around just after Sinn Fein's recent general election success in the south. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What month was that? February. February. It was, yeah. yeah. That was so, published in February. I mean, it must have been published in February as uh, well, I, shortly after the election. Yeah. So, uh, since then, yeah. almost immediately, we found ourselves in the maw of a COVID, international yeah. COVID epidemic. Yeah. Right. So, we, we know what's happened. There's basically been a, uh, I'm not going to say a ceasefire, such as maybe as a bad choice of words, but <laughs> we've, it, we've come together as basically a, a, a war party, a war government. We're not, we're not fighting with each other. Yeah. We're going to try and get through this first, then we, then we can let them... We can open fire again yeah. after, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> what do you think would have happened had the COVID crisis not happened? Uh, it's hard to say, but I think something really exciting would have happened because straight after the election, we obviously won the the popular vote. Uh, immediately, Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil tried to do a stitch up to keep us out of yeah. government, uh, and they're still they're still working on that, but. We held a series of public rallies across yeah. the the south, I remember them, and yeah. that that rattled the establishment. Like I mean, um, they were calling you Nazis. They were calling us not like the the, <laughs> I, the, 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 Leo Dragger, the leader of <laughs> of the party that actually fought alongside Nazis in the Spanish Civil War and wore Stop. the blue shirts and did the Hitler salute. Staggering, you, you know. But like it shows you two things. It shows you they were really afraid because we were mobilising people. I mean, um, myself and Rachel, we were at the one in Liberty Hall about a few days before the lockdown happened. Mm. Um, and like it, the hall itself was packed out, but on the quay uh, outside uh, Liberty Hall, they had, we had to lock the doors and ribbons. people were sprawling out onto the road. Yeah. People looking to get in. We had TDs that couldn't get into the hall because there's that many people there. Uh, in Cork on a Monday night, we filled the hall with a thousand people. Uh, you know, so like we tapped into. Uh, like a massive anger people were pissed off that like the party that they voted for were being excluded from government like we, we won the popular vote Crazy. and like Fianna Gael Fianna Fáil just thought they, they had they the right twisting, they were twisting the yeah, trend that's it yeah. so those public meetings would have continued um, but, but what yeah. would but I mean practically what does that mean does that mean that another GE would have been called it's potentially like anything could kind of happen uh, what we were aiming for was to build up the, that movement we wanted to uh, uh, mobilise those people and make yeah. sure they were kind of getting involved in, in politics in their yeah, local yeah. communities organise them make sure they don't see politics as a spectator sport like Leo Varadkar kind of alerted to because like part of the reason why he's calling us Nazis and everything and he, like he, people like Fine, and Fine Gael they hate to see ordinary people involved in politics because they're, they're fierce of course yeah. you know so that's that's their reaction like their rea they, they think that politics is to be left to professionals and you Joe Public you've, you can have your vote once every five years but do not open your gob between that Um so a run off bit off track there but no. yeah we, we would have uh, continued those public meetings I think uh, coming into the summer we could have held a big massive outdoor rally probably in Dublin Yeah. but our aim was to lead a left wing government uh, and if that was a minority government that that so be it you know but our aim was just to uh, yeah. get people excited about that get power on the streets because what we are conscious of as well is that if there is a left wing government in Ireland led by Sinn Féin 
just like any other left wing gov- uh, government in the world, the right wing establishment, the media, the civil service will close ranks and try to make it not work. So our counterpart to that is people power. So we need to be able to have mass street demonstrations. And um, would you would you say that uh, Irish republicanism's connections in America mm-hmm. might? change that ever so slightly because there is support even I mean I know I know mm-hmm. it's it's maybe support that we don't particularly want. Yeah. yeah. But it's there nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, whereas if a right wing our left wing government raises its head in South America, it gets its teeth kicked in yeah. by American imperialism straight away. Yeah. But maybe in Ireland that maybe wouldn't happen Might so be. quickly. Well all I know all of, all. I can really I can't really speak for Irish Americans, but just looking at the press like the Irish Central and everything, like they were excited about Sinn Fein's victory. Like I yeah. mean the people yeah. that support us in America want a United Ireland, you know, and yes, I, I think yes, that's, that's as far yeah. as the politics goes. And like, like, yeah, like I mean, as well, it, it can you can overestimate kind of, or you can overemphasize the socialism in our in our kind of manifesto in the general election there. But look, really, what we were looking for is kind of the bare minimum. It's kind of FDR kind of social yeah. democracy, Scandinavian social democracy. So well, it wasn't socialism. We weren't going to we weren't yeah. going to be nationalizing the state or like yeah. bringing the big companies into state ownership or anything. We were just looking uh, fair rents, free healthcare, really yeah. public transport, really basic things. And I think probably most Amer- uh, Irish Americans probably. Recognize that so, like, um, Joy, yeah. Rachel, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, Rachel's Irish American. <laughs> R- 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 uh, uh, Rory's partner's here. Rachel, uh, do you want to? I can hook you up with a mic, we can talk about this if you Sorry, brilliant. Irish yeah. American or just, the just in general, in general, give, give it two seconds. I'll get you sorted out. Yeah.